to another episode of Resetology, where conversations revolve around changing from the inside out. My name is Carissa, and I'm here today with Jeff and Julie to have an important conversation about brave conversations. And really what we're talking about is how to navigate really difficult conversations. So how would you guys define a difficult conversation? I mean, there's the obvious, it's difficult. (laughs) It's one that involves confrontation, and that can be a word that scares a lot of people off from having a conversation, but something has to be confronted, and it requires some bravery to do that. Yeah, it's also, if we think about how our minds process information, it's one where we know we are not going to be calm, cool, and collected. Like We we know that there's emotion, that we have strong emotion, and that we could be easily triggered or we could easily show a side of ourselves that we don't like to show. Nobody is signing up to have a hard conversation. You know, some people are a lot better at navigating conflict than other people, but nobody likes to have hard conversations. And so our default is to avoid these type of conversations. But why do you think that is that we will put off something that we absolutely should do and deal with six elephants in the room? (laughs) Why do we put off having these hard combos? I have two that I'm not proud of, but I'll admit them. One of them is it's just not important enough to warrant the confrontation because I have a lot of other things going on. It could be just me misplacing my priorities or having the things out of their proper place on my priority list. But another one is when I'm just really slammed and I'm jumping from obligation to obligation, I can just get apathetic about it. I can have this whatever attitude, that issue. I just can't afford to care about that right now. Again, I'm not proud to admit that, but when life gets crazy, work gets crazy, I just can't afford to care about everything. Mm -hmm. And my emotional tank gets really low. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is it's almost like we have to grade what level of a problem it is. Because if it's grade three, let's say grade three is the highest. Like if it's a grade three problem, we have to have it. But sometimes like a grade one, like you're talking about, it's like, "Eh, I can live with this. But the problem lies in if the grade one can turn into grade two and Mm. then it can turn into grade three. So putting off the low level stuff has the potential to become a really big problem. Yeah. And I think we're lazy by nature and we want to take that path of least resistance. So if we know that something is going to take emotional bandwidth or there's some kind of a risk to it, it's just so much easier to leave that as kind of last resort, like confrontation and actually working through the problem is last resort, even if it takes less energy than the avoidance. It's sometimes it's just not the easiest path. Mm-hmm. I like the word risk that you said, because I think that's a big part of it is it is a risk to have these type of conversations because we're risking the connection that we have with the other person. But most of the time I found on the other side of a hard conversation that we navigate well, the connection is going to be better in the long run. Yeah because healthy direct communication Mm -hmm. is the best type of relationships. But there's also the risk that this is going to go sideways and it's going to completely break our bond or it's not going to go well. And so we avoid the risk, which probably is going to pay off just because it could maybe not go well. Mm -hmm. And I think another reason that we don't have these conversations is I just think a lot of people don't have the skills to have them. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we want to focus our time on today is how do we do this? Like, How do we have these hard conversations because they're part of life? And so we want to walk through a process and I'm pulling a little bit in my notes, uh, first of all, from scripture, but then also there's a book called Emotionally Healthy Relationships by Peter and Jerry Scazzaro, mm-hmm. and then How to Have a Difficult Conversation by Dr. Cloud and Townsend. So yeah. pull a little bit from those resources if people are interested. The first thing that is really important is that we have to connect with somebody's heart rather than just launching into the ABCs of what the other person is doing wrong. Why is that so important? Mm. Yeah, I I think it's because if we allow ourselves to go to the point that we're just so worn down by the issue and then, you know, we need to confront the person about it, we may not have the emotional reserves to navigate that, to be able to connect with the person's heart because we've allowed ourselves to get worn down. And so getting ahead of that, anticipating it being proactive when we need to have our conversation allows us to to make sure that we've got the margin in our own emotions to be caring for the other person and respecting the other person. Yeah, we got to show that, that we value the person and we can see through the conflict to the 
the person on the other side of it that's way more important you know than than our feelings about the conflict connecting with the heart is so much more important and listening with the heart is so much more important than listening with the mind and mm-hmm. with the ears mm-hmm. you know if we do that we're not really gonna connect on an emotional level an empathic level and I think we can end up just trying to ch- take charge of a situation as opposed to approaching our difficult conversation partner as an equal, as a human being with perspectives of their own, opinions of their own, experiences of their own in this conflict that we're having with them. And if we try to take that approach, that I'm approaching you and I want this and this and this, I mean, people can be turned off, they can be intimidated, they can shut down. If we don't approach in a way that shows that we genuinely value this person, this could go sideways pretty quickly. Yeah, I think connecting with the heart, it's really about prioritizing the relationship over the problem. It's grounding the conversation and the connection that we have with the person. That part is so hard because in your mind, you've worked yourself up to talking about this really hard thing. And so it's like, I just want to get through this part because I want to get to the problem because I'm really worked up about how you're going to respond. Yeah. But it's really important to slow down and be sincere. But at the same time, we don't need to go on and on because if they know we're building up to dealing with an issue, it, it just can feel inauthentic and like we're trying to do a lot of flattery, you know, mm-hmm. so just take a minute or two to make that connection mm-hmm. or 30 seconds, even just something simple to start out with, because I love you. This is what I want for our relationship. Or I want you to know that you've meant a lot to me and I appreciate all of your hard work, but because I do, we need to have a difficult conversation. So it doesn't need to be long because you're probably going to lose them. Or like, just say it, mm-hmm. just say mm-hmm. it, just go there. I love Jesus and his, in the letters to the church, so many of those letters start out with positive things. Mm-hmm. I see this about you and you've been enduring and you list these good things. But then there's in three of the letters, there's a line that says something like this. But I have this one thing against you. Mm. One of them, it says, I have a few things against you. But it's a good model for saying the positive and connecting up front. So we always want to start by connecting with the heart, so Mm -hmm. connecting with the relationship. And then the second piece that we move into is we want to state the problem. And this seems straightforward enough, but what are keys to doing this well? Yeah. So something that I think is helpful is to start with a goal in mind, whether it's, you know, this is something that I'm trying to find a mutually beneficial solution to, Mm -hmm. or this is where I'd love to be, but I feel like we're not there right now. Like I want this, you want that. How can we get to a solution that makes sense? To try to get on the same side of the table with someone Mm -hmm. that has to do with resolving an issue, you know, setting that vision, setting that kind of aspiration that you can then both work towards. I think what's hard is when we let our frustration about an issue get to the point that we've gotten so anxious about it that now we're transmitting anxiety to the other person. Or Um, anger. Yeah, or anger. And then it just limits that creativity, the creative problem solving. You know, that I think James talks so much about the idolatry involved in what we want. And sometimes we have to confront because there's something that we want. There's a need that we have or there's something that we want that we need to ask the other person for. And when either of us get into anger, it can start to become an idolatry that makes it really hard Mm -hmm. to get on the same side of the table and resolve it. It's one thing to state the problem in a calm tone. It's another thing to get worked up and talk fast and come across as finger pointing. So even the language of using I rather than you, I noticed that or I I saw that. But the big thing is making sure it's firsthand. So Mm -hmm. something that I actually did see or hear or observe, what we never want to do is say, so-and-so told me that because then you and -and so-and-so are talking about me behind my back. Mm -hmm. So we never want it to be hearsay or secondhand information. We want to talk about something that we witnessed, we saw, that we observe, and we don't need to focus on 17 problems, not overwhelm the person, but we need to be specific and not global about it so they know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Quick interjection on that if I can. There was like two years ago, someone at work came to me and this was such a high character move. Mm. I barely interacted with this person. She's in another department, but we had a mutual acquaintance and she came to me and she said, Hey, like this person, our coworker Mm -hmm. said that 
you said this and this and this to this person. And I was like, no, Jeff didn't say that. And then she came to me and told me, hey, just so you know, this person is saying this and this and this about you. I had your back, but this person is way off about you. But I just appreciated what she did there. Mm -hmm. Here's some great sentence starters that I think are helpful. So I noticed, mention what you noticed firsthand, Mm -hmm. I was expecting. So then you're showing the disparity between what you witnessed and what your expectation was. Or I heard, again, this is firsthand, I heard you say X, Y, Z. Notice all of these are, are first person. The last one is I observed firsthand. I'm curious if you could tell me why that is. The conversation needs to be like passing a ball back and forth, you know, not like opening up a fire extinguisher and just blasting somebody. So we want to connect with the heart. We want to state the problem. And then we want to own our part. Usually there's some part of it that we can own, even if it's as simple as I should have come to you a lot sooner. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. Or here's my part of the problem. And we just state what it is. I had an expectation that I never communicated to you. And so I've been harboring this for a while. So just forgive me for that part. Again, all of these things, they're not things that we need to go on and on about, Mm -hmm. but just stating them clearly and putting it out on the table when we're stating the problem. I usually end up when I have to have, you know, difficult conversations, combine connecting the heart with stating the problem, owning my part and hearing the other side kind of all bang, bang, bang like that. Like something like, okay, I'm seeing this and this and and it doesn't feel right, which is stating the problem. And then I know I've made some mistakes like this and that, which is owning my part of it. Can you please forgive me for them, which is still owning my part. What, where are you at on these things? Help me understand how you see this. What are your feelings? Which is hearing their side. I've always been able to soften the space between me and another person that I have to have a hard conversation with when I start that way. You say, hey, things aren't right here. Here's what I've done. I'm sorry. Mm. Tell me where you're at on this. What do you think? This is really important. We need to hear their side because they're already feeling like they're in the hot seat. Yeah. And so we need to be in the position of listener and we need to truly be listening Mm -hmm. Which can be really hard because sometimes we've already passed a judgment on the situation. And so what are some keys to listening well? It's not a time to defend Mm ourselves when a person is expressing that they have had negative experiences with it. If they say, hey, well, I've seen you do this and this and this, and I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And not putting our guard up and launching into defense, but giving them the space to be completely open about that and as hard as that can be to empathize and to connect with the heart because if we're just connecting with the mind it's easy to turn it into a debate Mm -hmm. but there's a catch with listening with the heart because the heart wants to take it personally Mm -hmm. so there's just putting down your guns and zipping your lips for a few minutes and letting the person speak i think this is another case for raising an issue early rather than letting it fester. Because I think what can happen is that we can suppress our own emotions or even like gaslight ourselves around what we're experiencing because we want to please the other person, because we want to over empathize, like, oh, they must not have meant it. And so we don't address things that really are bothering us until we get to the point that we're just completely done and we don't have any bandwidth left we end up like a slingshot so i think that you know the the earlier we can catch things i think the better prepared we are to really empathize with the other person rather than having this inner dialogue that goes from one extreme to another yeah where we're just done with it Mm -hmm. you know we're doing the conversation because we know it's the right thing to do but in our mind and heart we're we're already done yeah we're already checked out Mm mm-hmm And it's so important when we're being the listener that we are taking the stance of presuming innocence until we've heard them out, kind of like a court case. Because sometimes it really is a misunderstanding. Yeah. And when we hear their side, we realize, oh, this is this makes sense now. Mm -hmm. Or we have a whole new sense of compassion for what they're going through. So let's say that it's somebody showing up late every single day to work and it's affecting everybody. It's become this huge thing, but we haven't dealt with it, haven't dealt with it. And now it's where we're just over it. Mm -hmm. But when we sit down and have this conversation, 
we may have no idea that the coworker is taking care of their elderly mom yeah. and the father has Alzheimer's and she's a single mom and she's trying to get the kid off to school. And so hearing their side of the story has a totally different perspective on the situation mm -hmm. once we hear them out. This part is so important that we truly listen. Yeah, and not assume. Right. Here's some sample prompts for hearing their side. One is help me understand how you see this. I want to hear from you on this. Mm -hmm. Just kind of throwing the ball in their court and letting them respond. Now, in the perfect world, they would say their part. They wouldn't get angry. They wouldn't get defensive. But this is not a perfect world. Mm -hmm. So this part of the conversation can go sideways pretty easily, especially if you're dealing with somebody who has a lot of unsafe characteristics, like yeah. they're not open to feedback, they want to blame or get defensive, or if they have an anger problem. So this is where the conversation can, can start to go sideways. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that we need to be aware of as we're giving someone space to respond? So I, I want to kind of flip the script a little bit and think about when I find it difficult when someone brings something hard to me is when I feel like they're unloading and talking about what's going wrong and not pointing the way to what can go right. Mm -hmm. And I think that when conversations go well, it's when someone, I believe that someone has my best interests in mind, that someone says, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to see. That's much easier for me to respond to than something that can come off as like, this is what I don't like, or this is like a criticism that feels personal, right? Like something that moves us in the same direction in terms of this is where we want to be. This is where mm -hmm. I want you to be. And then we can talk about the barriers to getting there or what that would look like or why that isn't the case now. So as I think about how to bring that constructive feedback or to bring a confrontation to someone that might have difficulty receiving it, I think we increase our chances by setting that aspirational goal. And then when they're getting defensive, then we can point back to that North Star. Like, this is where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. I understand that's your perspective. I understand that's how you feel. We're still not getting to where we need to be. How do we move the conversation to where we need to be so we get to a place where we're both happy with the solution? And part of that is understanding the type of person that you're dealing with. So as you're going into a conversation like this, you need to think it through, mm -hmm. think through what you're going to say. That's why we're having this podcast. But this part especially is important because you need to consider the background that you have with them. What, How have these type of conversations gone before? Or if you've observed them have conflict with another person, is their tendency going to be to storm off? Is it going to be to be open to mm -hmm. feedback? Is it going to be where they start blaming or start talking about my problems, you know, yeah. because I'm asking about theirs. And so thinking through what is likely to be their response. So then you can prepare yourself for that. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of hard to cut someone off once they go down the rabbit trail. You may want to let them go for like two, three minutes mm -hmm. just to start saying it. But then it's really important to cut in and just say, I, I understand you're really upset yeah. about what I said six months ago, but can we get back to and just pull them back to the thing that you're focusing on now? Mm -hmm. All right, I understand you're really upset with Jenny because of what she said, but right now let's get back to what we're talking about here today. Mm -hmm. But you've got to redirect back. Otherwise the conversation is going to rabbit trail and there's yeah. going to be no solution. Mm -hmm. So we connect with the heart. We state the problem. We own our part. We hear their side. And then we've already started to touch on this, but we want to request a win-win change. So we aren't just trying to you know, open this can of worms and not have any resolution. Mm -hmm. But we want to request something that's going to be a win for them and it's going to be a win for us. Mm -hmm. When we do this part, we need to be specific as well. So both parties are going to know when we've arrived. Sometimes we can be way too global about stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want you to be kind. But what's that look like? Because kind to one person may not be kind to the other. Yeah. And truth be told, if they knew what it looked like, they might already be doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, usually when we're messing up, it's because we're, we're oblivious. Like we're, we're blinded by our own needs. We're mm -hmm. blinded by our own desires or, or yeah. vision for something. If we knew what to do, we would probably do it. 
you know, I think requesting the win-win is it's a team effort to get to the win-win as mm-hmm. opposed to one person. Like if I initiate the conversation, it's not necessarily 100% my call as to what a win-win looks like. That's just a form of domination, I think. It goes back to listening with the heart. If I haven't been listening with the heart, then I don't really know what is a win for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I might know what a win for me is. If I've only been processing things intellectually and not empathetically, then my quote unquote win win is really just an I win, you lose mm-hmm. kind of a thing. And that's not how Christians are called to deal with our with yeah. our problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are certainly not innocent of that, but it's also not who we're called to be. The empathetic heart wants a win for both parties. So let's let me share a scenario because it that makes it a little bit easier to yeah. apply these things. So let's say that it is a couple, since I'm a wife, I'm just going to blame it on the husband, right? Let's say that the <laughs> husband has a problem with anger. And so when he gets upset, he raises his voice, gets angry. The wife shuts down. That makes him more upset. But what really bothers her is that this keeps happening in front of the kids. And so she's decided to have a conversation like this and do all the things that we're talking about. Connect with the heart, say what the problem is, own her part. She's given him an opportunity to share. And then she gets to this part, request a win-win change. What would it sound like in that scenario to suggest a win-win yeah, I think before you get there, she has to understand what it's like for him to have that anger issue. You know, what causes the outbursts and what does a win look like for him? And I think in a time when he's not angry, because when he is angry, his executive functioning is out the window and he can't really process well enough to actually answer that question. What does a win look like? Yeah. And, and that comes back to values too, right? Like I value our communication and mm-hmm. I want to communicate clearly, openly mm-hmm. with you. What does that look like to you? Because this mm-hmm. is what it looks like to me. These are the times that I feel like we get off track when you feel like we're getting off track. Yeah. So just some phrases like, would you be willing to, when you feel anger coming on, would you be willing to just express to me, I'm getting angry. So I need to go blow off some steam, go for a walk, go for a drive in the car, go do 50 sit-ups, whatever. But would you be willing to just tell me I'm getting upset right now? So I need to go blow off some steam. And then would you also be willing, if I'm feeling that way, to say, I, I'm really starting to shut down. And we can agree that we're going to wait until we've calmed down to mm-hmm. have this conversation. Can we also agree that we're not going to have these type of conversations in front of the kids? While that's not getting to the root of the anger, it's at least giving really clear language to navigate what it looks like when it happens in the moment. These are some words and some phrases that we can say. Another great sentence starter is, it would help me if you... So if we use this scenario, saying something like, it would help me if when you got angry, you didn't raise your voice, you didn't stand up. I feel like you're towering over me. It really makes me want to shut down. Things to show that a boundary is being crossed. But I love this last part here because this goes back to it being mutual. After we've stated what a win-win is, because as Jeff mentioned, a win for us might not be a win for the other person, throwing the ball back in their court and saying, I'd like to hear where you think we can go from here. So, you know, what's a win for them? Mm -hmm. The next thing is to establish natural consequences if necessary. So perfect world, these conversations go well, even though they're hard, you can get on a win-win. Sometimes you can Mm -hmm. because what you think is a win, they don't think is a win or they're just not a safe person. So there are times where these conversations do not go well at all and you may need to set really clear boundaries and follow through. So saying things like, If you start demeaning me, I'm going to leave the conversation or I'm going to leave the room. Or if you continue getting drunk, I'm not going to make excuses for you anymore. But again, that's communicating really clearly and then following up with our actions so that later on when it happens, they can get upset and angry and they probably will, but it's been clearly communicated. Yeah, it can be really easy to jump to this. (laughs) And that's the opposite of help. Emphasis, so it says establish natural consequences if necessary. And emphasis on those last two words that the conversation up to this point has failed. This person isn't able to connect with me on a heart to heart basis. I've empathized, I've sought a win for this person, 
that I'm able to accept. Even if maybe this person is winning more than I'm winning, I'm, I'm willing to accept. I've done everything I can do. Um, I've owned my part. I've asked for forgiveness. I've heard their side. I've listened with empathy. But at the end of the day, this conversation is failing. Mm -hmm. Then it's necessary to establish mm -hmm. natural consequences. It can be really easy to jump to this before the empathy. You know, mm -hmm. like, oh, you're angry. Well, if you don't stop, then this is it before you actually have the conversation, you know, and go through the steps. Yeah. And conflict avoidance is a reason why people get divorced. They don't want to have the hard conversation, so they just drift apart and then take unilateral decisions. And there are times where you're having these conversations and the conversation just needs to end because it's gotten too emotional. Mm -hmm. When you get in that emotional part of your brain, you're not thinking logically. You just can't make good decisions. You're outside of your window of what you can tolerate. Mm -hmm. And things are going to get said or done that people are going to regret. And so if it gets escalated, it's best to just say, hey, I don't think this is the best time for us to continue this conversation. But then give a time frame. Can we circle back around after the weekend? Yeah. Or can we talk again tomorrow night when we've both calmed down and had some time to think about it? That is the wisest thing that we can do in a moment like that because it's not going to go anywhere well. Timing is super important for having the difficult conversation. So then the next piece is, is just returning to that I'm for you stance. And this doesn't need to be drug out. Again, it's continuing to connect to the person and connect to the relationship and not have the full focus be on the problem. Mm -hmm. Jeff and I were talking about this podcast the other day and kind of talking through the process. He's like, yeah, it's like a poop sandwich. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you got the bread and butter at the beginning, then you talk about all the crap, and then you have the bread and butter at the end. It's like a poop sandwich. That's exactly. And Carissa's PGifying that phrase. By the way. <laughs> That's what we don't want to do. Compliment. Then I'm going to hit you in the face with the poop, and then compliment again. We're done. Eat yeah. it. <laughs> Oldest trick in the book, right there. People. Smell that a mile away, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but then just to wind this up, we do want to follow up. No matter how the conversation went, we want to follow up within a day or so. So if the conversation went well, we, we want to follow up and just thanks for talking with me. I feel better knowing that we're on the same page or just a simple, how's it been going since we talked? Again, to just nurture that relationship. But if it didn't go well, we do need to follow up with another time to meet with them. Otherwise, the elef we just put another elephant yeah. in the room yeah. if we don't follow through with finishing the conversation. So that's a lot. You know, and th these kind of conversations are not always linear. Mm -hmm. Growth is not always linear. But these, I would say they're more like tools in your belt to help you navigate these really difficult conversations. Yeah, if, if we navigate these well, I mean, wow, what, what a bond we can create with the other person. What trust we can establish with the other person that we've been able to do something really hard together. Yeah, for sure. Makes your relationship stronger or at the very least more mature. We know the relationship is now pioneered into new to new places. And when hard conversations are successful, we can yeah, trust each other at, at new levels. And we learn a lot about each other when we succeed or even when we fail at hard mm -hmm. conversations. Mm -hmm. So success builds our confidence that we can work things out in the future. Yeah, I think it's like a muscle. I, I've heard grief described that way. The grief is like a muscle. We have to learn how to, how to grieve. And I think it's that way with confrontation too. We have to learn how to have card conversations and build those muscles. And I think what's helpful is... When we think in terms of having these difficult conversations is taking an inventory. I know for me, if I take an inventory of when I've put off these conversations until I'm just done, I've lost a lot mm -hmm. because of that. So just doing an inventory, of what does it cost me when I put this off versus what have I gained when I navigated these hard conversations well? Mm -hmm. Because really what it is, is it's a barrier between me and another person. When the barrier is removed, I feel more connected to that person. We feel more bonded. We understand each other better. And so the payoff is huge. And honestly, unless we're dealing with a really unsafe person, most of these conversations, things turn out way, way better mm -hmm. on the other side because we took the risk to have it. 
Thank you for listening. We hope this message encouraged you. For additional resources or information on our upcoming events, head to resetministries.us. That's resetministries.us.